last one. Coach. I mean, Samira. Yeah. Oh my god. Oh my god, it was a very good. It was a scooter. We anchored up and sailed out from the shore of Spain. Our boat say to Olive is her name. And Olive is the symbol of a faraway place to which we steer our course across the waves. We are 13 women here to sail with peace in our hand towards our sisters in this foreign land. To and from any different corners of this world we have come to bring to you the freedom of a song. We will sail for your freedom, our sisters in Palestine. We will never be silent until you We are guided by the lights of the stars at night and the power of the sea so very bright. As the world is watching us, we bring our women's voice with a message that we all should have a choice. Your grandmothers, they planted all in trees. Thank you very much for all of the support. Free, free Russia! Free, free Russia! Free, free Russia! Thank you so much. daughters plant, you see. We will stand on the sea. Our sisters in Palestine, we will never be silent. Welcome, Bozo. Seiko, uh, Ahana bienvenue. I'm very happy to be speaking to you this evening from, uh, well, evening or daytime, depending on where you are, from the traditional lands of Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabek, uh, Atawandaran, and Lenape people on the shores of the Deshkan Zibi, the Antler River, also called the Thames, in the uh, city of London, Ontario. Um, an area covered by the dish with one spoon wampum and other treaties. And when we, we talk about decolonizing and, de and colonialism in other parts of the world, we remember also that we're, uh, we deal with uh, the necessity of respectful relations among nations here and the importance of treaties and, and international law on a local scale as well as an international scale. We're streaming to you today from uh, unceded coastal Salish territory in uh, British Columbia on the Pacific coast of Turtle Island. Uh, and we're very happy to be talking with friends across the Pacific, uh, partners in the Freedom Flotilla. I'm with the Canadian Boat to Gaza, and Freedom Flotilla partners include uh, Kira, Kira Gaza in Aotearoa, uh, New Zealand, uh, and Gaza Freedom Flotilla Australia. And other friends are joining us this evening, and we're really delighted to have uh, friends from um, uh, Free Palestine Melbourne, uh, who are uh, also hosting us this evening. Uh, a little idea of how this is going to run. We will, after this short introduction, uh, begin the film, which will be streaming to you. Um, almost 200 people, 178 participants have joined us, which is great. Uh, there is a Q&A chat box uh, for uh, your text questions. Um, and uh, when the film ends, it lasts just under an hour and a half, uh, we will be joined by filmmaker Abby Martin uh, and then by a friend from Gaza. Um, See a whole lot of other people? and then uh, we'll have a, Q a question and answer with them. 
So over to you, Nayland, to tell us a little bit about Free, uh, Free Palestine Melbourne. Um, thank you everyone for joining us and to all of our uh, partners in, in organising this event. Uh, Free Palestine Melbourne is um, based here in, in Nam, which is the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people, part of the Kulin Nation, where sovereignty has never been ceded. Um, and I'd like to echo David's points about um, reflecting on and working on colonial histories and making peace in the lands that we live on. Um, I, I might also note that today is actually Anzac Day in Australia, so a day that's pretty significant for um, Australians, Indigenous Australians and Turkish people that all, um, I guess, had a, a pretty traumatic and um, impactful time um, and we reflect on the tragedy of war and remember lives lost. Um, thank you all for joining us. We're a very new organisation. This is our second event and we're hoping to get more local engagement and to build up this movement here. So please reach out afterwards and we hope you enjoy the film. So without further ado, um, people are noting it's also Anzac Day in Aotearoa, New, New Zealand. Um, and in a few moments, we'll be ready to go to the film. هذه بنتنا ورزان بمسابة كانت بنتي الكبيرة أول فرحة يعني أول شابة مسعفة ميدانية متطوعة كانت هي أول شابة كشابة يعني كفتاة تنزل على المخيمات العودة والكل شيء بادر فيها وشارك فيها أنا كمان شاركت كل البيت شارك زوجي وأولادي وجيراني وإخواني كل العالم يعني كل الفلسطينيين شاركوا يا مش أكتر هي صح رايحة وهذا وبعدين مسيرتنا مسيرة سلمية ما إحنا حاملين سلاح ولا إشي بالعكس إحنا بصدورنا الع العارية أمام قوة كبيرة من الجيش اللي هي مدرعاتهم وأسلحتهم وغازهم وطائراتهم إحنا مسيرتنا سلمية بنطالب بحقنا من حقي كل أنا إلي بلد من حقي كل بيت من حق اللي متشردين في البلاد في كل مكان هذول النازعين يجوا على بيوتهم ما انا الاوان ما كلهم قاعدين في العالم كله قاعدين بيتفرجوا علينا كل واحد مرتاح احنا عندنا حصار لا معابر شغالة ولا دنيا وين بدهم يروحوا That's a very powerful film um, hard to watch at spots uh, but we had a for us, a record number of people that stayed with us during the film. I'm not sure if all the participants can see this, but there were as many as 238 people watching from uh, many different places, especially Australia, Aotearoa, New Zealand, but also uh, Malaysia and some places in, uh, in North America as well. And I'm sure there are other participants. Um, there's questions coming in on the question box, so I will just take a moment uh, to um, introduce our panelists. Uh, we have with us uh, to talk about the film that she made, uh, visual artist and journalist, anti-imperialist journalist, Abby Martin, um, joining us live from, from California. And uh, early in the morning in, uh, in Palestine, from, from Gaza, from We Are Not Numbers, a young group of aspiring and inspiring journalists who tell the stories behind the statistics from behind the blockade. We have Raid uh, Shakshak from We Are Not Numbers joining us. Uh, welcome, Abby. Are you there? I am here. Thank you so much for having me again. Thank you for joining us. To be a part of this again. It's great to have you here. Can you tell us a little bit about the making of the film? Absolutely. So uh, it all kind of came together starting before the Great March of Return a couple years back when my partner Mike Preisner and I, who hosts The Empire Files together, which is a short documentary investigative series that people can check out on our YouTube channel at Empire Files, um, where we have a range of subjects that we've covered that you can watch for free about uh, the brutal military occupation, about how black lives are treated, um, about all of these things uh, within Israeli society. We also do some pretty shocking men on the streets with some Israeli citizens that uh, kind of 
reveal themselves a little too much. Um, but so while we were in the West Bank, we wanted to get into Gaza. Of course, this is a dire humanitarian crisis that we are directly sponsoring with our tax dollars. We filled out all the proper paperwork and we had proper press credentials issued from Telesor, which was the outlet that we were selling Empire Files to at the time. And I was told by Netanyahu's um, underhand uh, press secretary that uh, I was an Iranian agent and a propagandist and not a journalist. Therefore, I was banned for life from getting into Gaza. Uh, not too surprising. I mean, while we were on the trip that we were on in the West Bank, I saw just an average American girl who was not there to report anything get turned away at the Tel Aviv airport and be banned from entering just because she had an Arab language book in her bag. So I, I wasn't too shocked. I, I, I know that I'm on the radar of the Israeli government, but needless to say, it was really disheartening because I wanted to meet and connect with my brothers and sisters within Gaza. A year and a half later, when the Great March of Return sparked off, it was absolutely abhorrent the way the corporate media was covering this incredible movement unlike anything that we've seen in, in recent history. I mean, tens of thousands of Palestinians from all stripes of Palestinian life, marching in droves to the fence, unarmed, uh, just really incredible. And they were getting called uh, the same thing, you know, I mean, getting dehumanized by the corporate media, saying that they were all trying to die, that it was a mass suicide attempt. I mean, you saw yourself uh, the way that the corporate media paints Palestinians, no matter what they do. Um, and Ahmed, the organizer of the march, I'll never forget in an interview that he gave about Westerners asking him, you know, where are the Palestinian Gandhis? You know, this, this contempt from, from Western society, just saying, why can't you guys be like Gandhi? And he was like, there were 200 of them and they were shot dead at the fence. Um, but, you know, we, since we couldn't get into Gaza, we ended up linking up with a team of Palestinian journalists um, about the Great March. First, it was just going to be a short collaboration for Empire Files, maybe a series of short documentaries. Once we collaborated with these journalists um, and saw the footage that they accumulated, I mean, when you see the absolute brilliance, uh, the cinematic, incredible brilliance that Asma Tia Hamad and Maz Mazama captured at the Great March of Return, we knew that we had to take a year off from our work and put together this full feature length film. And that's exactly what we did. Um, and you may notice that we had to redact our main producer's name at the end of the film. Um, this was a gentleman that I was on the phone with every day for a year, coordinating things on the ground, getting us the incredible footage, facilitating interviews, all of that. And when the film came out, he said he wanted to remove his name because he was afraid that he would be reprimanded, uh, banished from leaving Gaza for his entire life that the Israeli government knew that he was involved in the making of the film. And so while we were on this giant tour in North America promoting the film, it was really quite shocking to kind of have that reality check. But this is what people in Gaza are dealing with every day. These are the stakes uh, that they deal with, uh, with presenting this information. And so I, I'm happy that we were able to use ourselves as, as conduits to present the material from the Gaza journalists and simply use my, um, you know, our ability to just kind of weave their voices together in the footage that they gave to us to present to you. And it, and it is amazing footage. It's remarkable from a cinemat cinematographic point of view, as you say, as well as for the, the story that it's telling that, as a number of people are commenting in the, in the Q&A, stories we don't usually hear, stories that are kept from us. So it, you know, apart from the, the physical blockade uh, all around Gaza, there's also the media blockade, that our media typically doesn't report the truth, and they certainly don't speak to Palestinian voices. One of the things that we um, find really important in the... Um, Freedom Flotilla Coalition and our partners like uh, Aotearoa Aotearo, uh, Gaza and uh, Gaza Freedom Flotilla Australia, and I'm sure our other partners here like Free Palestine Melbourne and other solidarity groups is to give voice to Palestinian voices because they're either not represented or misrepresented, as you, you show beautifully the, the malicious editing of Razan's own words. Um, so they're either absent or distorted when they're here, and we love to bring words of Palestinians in Gaza, Palestinians elsewhere, but especially Palestinians in Gaza, their elegant words. And we'll be joined shortly by Ra'ed Shakshak from um, We Are Not Numbers. It's very early in the morning in Palestine right now. And on top of that, people have been fasting. So he'll be getting up before dawn to uh, 
to have something before the day's fast, before sunlight. Um, I think Rahid is here and he just needs to become visible. Um, but maybe you could comment a little bit on what you see people doing in the States, in Australia, in New Zealand, in Canada, and, and everywhere around the world. Um, and people are, are, are expressing this, this revulsion at what has happened um, and what is continuing to happen and wondering what they can do as residents of these different countries. Sure. I mean, I think that first and foremost, the, the fight needs to be in the heart of the U.S. empire because this is, uh, you know, Israel's essentially like a, a colony of the U.S. I mean, the U.S. uses Israel as a battering ram in the Middle East. Uh, we are sponsoring with U.S. tax dollars to the tune of $10 million a day, uh, billions of dollars a year. We all know what happened under Obama, <laughs> you know, this so-called uh, liberal president, uh, the largest aid deal in recent history. Of course, part of that was actually to make sure that Israel would continue to buy US weaponry from our military industrial complex. Needless to say, I think the fight is super crucial here. And it's a shame that Americans are kind of late to the game in terms of the rest of the world. I see the rest of the world really, really acting and moving forward with this and taking the initiative um, all across Europe. Um, Australia, I mean, even Canada, it seems like people were way more receptive to this material when we were on the tour showing the film. But again, to provide some hope and inspiration here in America, there are massive waves of change happening here. You look 10 years ago, 15 years ago, rather, at the Iraq War movement when it was erupting. And there was a huge faction in that movement of people saying free Palestine does not belong with uh, U.S. out of Iraq. That's too, too divisive, right? We don't want to, to mix messages. Um, and now, if you enter a progressive space and you are not pro-Palestine, you are not welcome. You are not a progressive. You are not a liberal. Do not front as you are. And I think that that generational shift just in the last 15 years is a massive, massive thing. I mean, just look at Bernie Sanders. Uh, he is a Zionist, he's an imperialist, I, I understand that, but his rhetoric alone, this cycle compared to the 2016 election cycle shows that this movement, this massive multi-generational grassroots movement pushing from the left has shifted the dialogue so far that you had Bernie Sanders even acknowledging some things that Hamas did in their new charter, <laughs> which is that the US needs to force Israel to withdraw settlements to the 1967 borders and the military occupation and the siege. I mean, all of these things that, you know, should be just common sense, but to hear a U.S. Po political candidate for president acknowledging these things as a Jewish American was quite profound, was quite profound when four years prior, he could barely muster the words disproportionate in the debate with Hillary Clinton about what Israel was doing in its massacre of Gaza in 2014. So, I take all of these things um, you know, as, as hopeful. I think that the fact that people are having this mass awakening, linking these struggles together, where it be, whether it be Black Lives Matter, police being trained um, all across Israel, you know, NYPD headquarters having, having a branch in Tel Aviv, whether it be Elbit systems at the border, um, the technology being provided to cage undocumented people, I think people are, are, are linking this together and understanding how Israel fits into the U.S. empire's hegemony, into the broader role of imperialism, and are fighting against that. And you see divestment campaigns happening all across the world. You see labor unions in Britain um, unequivocally voting to divest from Israeli, uh, from, from companies that are profiting off the military occupation. You see that happening all across Europe. Whenever there is a bombing of Gaza, you see thousands of people taking to the streets in all of these countries as well. Uh, but the divestment campaigns here in the U.S. Are, are quite important. And that's what's actually startling the Netanyahu administration um, and Israeli society as a whole, because all of these preemptive anti-BDS measures that have taken root, that I'm actually actively engaged in a lawsuit against the state of Georgia to fight against this immoral, illegal, blatantly unconstitutional law that says that you cannot boycott the state of Israel if you want to simply speak or, or make money or work in this state. There's 26 states that also have enacted such laws. Um, so all of these things, it's a multifaceted approach to fighting this, um, to standing in solidarity with the Palestinian people, whether it's getting engaged with local solidarity movements, um, taking a cue from, from local Palestinians who are telling you what you can do as white, white allies. 
um, whether it's getting actively involved in their divestment campaigns at a campus level, um, whether it's downloading the, the anti-boycott um, app, or I'm sorry, the, the pro-boycott, the BDS app on your phone, getting, getting familiar with these companies that are profiting off this, using that as, uh, as a tool to galvanize protests around, to galvanize awareness around, whether it's getting in the streets um, to stand in solidarity with our Palestinian brothers and sisters whenever they are getting accosted, bombed, especially in the wake of this COVID global pandemic, to understanding and, and linking Gaza um, through the awareness uh, of, of the pandemic, I think is really important. So everything that you do, I mean, this is a massive political awareness campaign because once people know and once people see, they cannot unsee. And there was a poll done in America, and this is the last thing I'll say, sorry for going on and on, but there was a poll recently done that asked Americans, you know, because I think a lot of Americans are still under the idea that there is some hope for a two-state solution, right? This is, this is something that's been dead since the Oslo Accords, but Americans still don't understand that because we're so brainwashed by our corporate media and this staunch allegiance to Israel. Once they understand that there is no hope, that the West Bank has been completely atomized, and that really we're talking about a one state solution, democratic rights for all, they are asked point blank, and, and I think two thirds of Americans say, yeah, that makes sense, a democratic state, uh, you know, one state. Um, and so once you understand the issue, it's very, very cut and dry. And that's where my hope lies, is just uh, politically educating people, spreading information or like this film, showing the truth on the ground, uplifting Palestinian voices, and just being there as an ally, doing whatever I can to um, link this together with everything else that's going on, David. Thanks, Abby. Um, I hope you can hear me. This is Naomi coming from Australia, where I think we can probably um, relate to a lot of those uh, issues you flagged about the media control and the importance of the BDS movement. Um, we've had a few questions about the making of your film. Um, one is that there's a lot of amazing footage in there, including footage from uh, a sniper's perspective. Um, and also there was a, a picture about um, a map of greater Israel um, and the intention for a, a greater Israel. Could you speak a little bit about this um, and where that information is from what that um, intention is, as you understand. Sure. Um, I forget. What, I'm sorry. What was the first part of your question? Oh, the sniper's uh, nest. Right. Right. The sniper's nest. Um, so a lot of people have asked about where did we get the footage from, from the sniper's nest. And um, it's amazing that we actually, it, it was actually leaked from an Israeli Facebook group of IDF soldiers who were sharing around kind of death footage, right? Uh, snuff footage that they were killing people at the border, laughing about it and sharing it around, um, admiring it with each other in this Facebook group. So a lot of people thought, oh, it's a whistleblower who's trying to expose, you know, what the IDF is doing. Kind of to the contrary, it was kind of just leaked um, by happenstance from a group that was sharing a lot of videos similar to that, uh, very disturbing in nature. And I think that when you look at these polls that we show at the end of the film, which is, you know, the vast majority, 83% of Israelis within Israeli society agree with this open fire policy, agree with the right to shoot to kill on armed protesters. Um, and, and, and the polls go on and on. I mean, they really kind of elucidate what we're dealing with um, in terms of this increase of fascism in Israeli society. Uh, the last presidential election was between Trump and Trump light, if you can even say that he was a Trump light. I mean, Benny Gantz is, is also a war criminal responsible for massacres uh, and, and also wants the annexation of the West Bank. So it, it, there really is no choice, right? There, there is no left that can fight what's going on, which is why the boycott divestment movement is so important outside of Israeli society to work with the few leftists that do exist there, the few anti-Zionists that are present in Israeli society to galvanize with this international solidarity movement, the international pressure as the organizer um, explained so well that this is the moment that they're trying to achieve uh, just like the apartheid falling in South Africa. And so, um, you know, as I mentioned before, we have this, these interviews with Israeli citizens um, that were absolutely shocking. I mean, from all stripes of, of Israeli life, uh, from U.S. born to Israeli born to European born, I mean, all these people who are just average Israeli citizens or just settlers or just Americans who are living there 
um, studying abroad or whatnot, and, and the kind of genocidal bloodlust that comes through with the average people who are living there is absolutely appalling. It's something that uh, Americans certainly don't hear or see, <laughs> and, and we're told that the opposite is true, right? When, to the contrary, when we were in the West Bank, I mean, I didn't hear one Palestinian utter anything remotely similar to what Israelis kind of casually f say about what should happen to Palestinians. So I think it's really important for people to kind of wrap their minds around why we say there is no hope from within Israeli society, why, why this needs to be an external pressure campaign. As far as the map of greater Israel, this is something that it's not just, um, you know, the small sect of Israeli society. I've had, I've had discussions with some people who say that that's um, not relevant today in Israeli society. I think that just the presence of Israel in the Golan Heights, <laughs> um, encroaching in both Syria and Lebanon kind of uh, says the opposite, right? I mean, this is, this is an expansionist colonial, settler colonial state that is continuing to encroach on territory that is outside of even what is indigenous Palestine. Um, and I, I, I don't see how you could really argue that fact. These maps that we have um, were actually gotten from prominent politicians who are uh, hailed, you know, who are very relevant in Israeli society. I think that if you pulled the Knesset members, I'm sure a lot of them would agree that that land belongs to them, whether or not there are actual plans militarily to take, you know, the land that, that's, that's laid out in that map is unknown. But I think that just uh, the expansion already into Syria and Lebanon really says a lot. And it says that they are continuing to uh, go beyond the borders of even indigenous, indigenous Palestine. And it is very disturbing that the U.S., again, and, and its kind of colonial outposts are endorsing this, sponsoring this, and just mm -hmm. think that this is rightfully theirs. Thanks, Abby, for answering all of those bundle, that bundle of questions. Um, we have Rayed now joining us from Gaza. Thank you so much for joining us, especially so early in the morning. Um, Rayed is the outreach coordinator for We Are Not Numbers, which is a group of aspiring and inspiring journalists who are reporting on the ground from Gaza. Um, and we're so thankful to have you with us. Are you, are you able to join your camera now, Rayed? Hi, hi everyone. Um, well, it is indeed um, morning very early here in Gaza. It is 5, you know, 20 a.m. and uh, it is Ramadan as well. So uh, I guess I had to sleep early to wake up early for this and I gotta be ready for this and I am ready for this. So thank <laughs> you for having me. Thank you. Um, there's been uh, a, that movie obviously highlighted a lot of uh, really terrible conditions in, in Gaza and some pretty um, shocking elements of uh, warfare at the um, at the front lines. Do you have you seen any change or much much change in the approaches that are, are coming through there, or how how are you feeling on the ground now? Well, uh, first let me start with uh, thanking Abby for this incredible film about Gaza and the borders and the Greater Turmoil, and uh, thank you for exposing Israel and for telling the world what's really happening there. Uh, of course, we know social media has been helping Gaza a lot recently, especially that more people are getting their eyes more open to Gaza, what's happening here, and um, thanks to the power of you know, technology, everyone has got a camera right now in their smartphones, so uh, everyone can talk, everyone can write, everyone can be heard. So uh, recently, of course, the Greater Termarch uh, has not been going on due to coronavirus, so uh, the borders are now very calm, but uh, this just took about two years ago, over two years ago when it's all started, and uh, we're talking about so many people uh, who went there, to express themselves, to protest, to demand their rights, to go out and uh, speak out to the world, to have their lands back, to have the right of return. So we're talking about Gaza that's got so many refugees. And um, we're also talking about journalists and paramedics who went there to help 
and to spread awareness and uh, to help people who got injured or even killed. And uh, we're, we're talking about Israel, who's been using its army against civilians, people, you know, here in Gaza. Uh, they got snipers, they got uh, power tanks, they got towels, they got everything. And uh, when you look at Gaza and you see what's happening here, all you see is people, you know, people in Gaza. So. Uh, uh, I think uh, this film is incredible and, uh, you know, it tells what's really happening, but at the same time, it makes my heart as a Palestinian here in Gaza. And uh, well, one of the things that I really want to comment about is the, the fact that our lives as Palestinians, especially here in Gaza, uh, don't seem to worth as much as any other people's lives. And, um, you know, uh, as as you were watching this film, uh, you heard that you know a Palestinian gets killed, it's nothing. But if an Israeli gets injured, not killed, injured, it's like the whole turns upside down. And uh, this actually happens. And uh, if you think about all the Palestinian journalists here in Gaza, so many went to the borders, got shot. So many went there, got killed. So many are afraid to actually get there because they know they're not safe, even though it is prohibited to kill journalists. It is prohibited to kill paramedics, but at the same time, Israel yet kills them. So so many doctors wouldn't go there. So many nurses wouldn't go there. Any, any medical people wouldn't go there. But at the same time, if you take a look at what's really happening there, you can see foreign journalists actually get there, but they know they're safe. They know if something happened to them, They've got countries that have got their packs, but Palestinians, they don't have that anymore. So uh, it's really sad. It's really breaking hard. But uh, at the same time, this is just about the advantages of the greater, the greater term march and uh, how it managed to grab the world's attention to Gaza and what's happening in Gaza and uh, what Israel does the whole time so that all the people actually who defend Israel, who see Israel is defending itself, can see that and they cannot deny that. You know, um, as Abby said, you cannot unsee what you already saw. So um, right now, I think uh, the image is clear to everyone. You can see the palms, you can see the, the bullets that got into our bodies and actually got them into pieces, you know, uh, and no one is safe so i'm just gonna have to repeat that time after time after time no one is safe and uh if, if you see the people here in gaza this has become a phenomenon here when you walk out in the street and you, you can see so many news i'm talking about like hundreds of Jews who've got like their heads uh, i'm sorry who got their body parts actually got up talking about their legs and some of them their hands and uh it is really let's just say frightening to see the future of Gaza in this way because we are the future of Gaza and uh, and no one here doesn't know anyone that hasn't got shot let's just say I've got cousins I've got friends I've got family members they all got shot and for me as a storyteller from Gaza as a young journalist it is really hard for me to go there to the borders to talk about Palestine, to talk about Gaza, and to try to represent my people, especially in the international language, the English language, because I know if I went there, I will be shot. The problem is that, is it wise to go there, risk it all, and get shot just to represent your people? Or is it wise to not go there because you know you're definitely gonna get shot? So uh, it is bravery, it is wisdom, and uh, so many people went, so many people did not. Um, we are not numbers have actually sent a group of its people to the Greater Turn March and um, they talked a little bit over there. But at the same time, you cannot go there every day and you, you cannot go there a lot because your face is gonna get familiar and eventually a sniper is gonna shot you. So uh, that's, I think, everything for the Greater Turn March. Um, it's really heartbreaking, you know, to see people like Yasser Murtaja, the famous journalist who was killed, and uh, it broke our hearts as journalists. It broke it broke our hearts as Palestinians here in Gaza. And um, talking about Razan, 
you know, she's an angel, the angel of mercy. And uh, she was a young girl who would go there for one purpose, one purpose only, to do what she believes in. You know, she's a paramedic, she goes there, she helps people, those who get injured. And uh, eventually she was shot from the back, even though uh, this happens all the time, paramedics and journalists are dressing, you know, their customs and they go there, they've got signs, you know, they tell the Israel army that we're not here to fight. We've got no guns, we've got nothing. We're here to help these people. But eventually Israel was still shot in because Israel, of course, it wouldn't want other people to capture what they're doing. So it's like an Israeli sniper shooting a bullet to a Palestinian journalist who's shooting, you know, using his camera. And uh, I think the situation here, um, like less and less people would go to the borders because they would think like, like if journalists are not safe, if paramedics are not safe, do you think I would be safe? Talking about those protesters who, who would go there. So uh, less people will be frightened. And I actually believe they have the right to be frightened because, you know, sometimes they've got families that they got to put food on the table for. So they, they cannot just die and leave their families behind. This happened a lot. And they've got friends who will be heartbroken, you know, after they're gone. And uh, even if you talk about Gaza, when it comes to hospitals, you know, Gaza's hospitals are really, really bad. I, I mean, they've been bombed during the Israeli wars on Gaza. They lack medical facilities, medical equipment, medical tools. So even if you get shot, seriously, the humiliation starts after you get shot. And uh, I witnessed that in person here, especially in my city, just, you know, a couple months ago, a couple months ago, I actually saw this guy with his old mother who were coming all the way from Japan, you know, from the north to my city in the south because uh, he, he got shot in his leg. You know, it's not cut off, but still. And uh, he needed a surgery and Gaza lacks equipment and tools. So uh, that was really, really sad. And uh, I think because of the economic situation here in Gaza, uh, people cannot even afford to eat. So if you think about like, how are they gonna afford to get, you know, medicine, you know? So we're talking about drugs, you know, painkillers, they cannot afford to, to get that. So uh, it was a really long and sad time for all those people who were shot because, um, you know, the lists are full of people, we're talking about hundreds. And uh, so many of them, like they had nothing that would stop their pain and uh, they would be in pain physically their friends and families would be in pain you know emotionally and uh you know very few people actually managed to get out of the gaza strip to get medication some of them in turkey so uh uh you're talking about tens out of hundreds or even thousands absolutely absolutely abby i know you have to go do you have a, some final comments to leave with us Oh, I have about 50 more minutes. I'd oh, like okay, to, good. yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. um, Rad, you, you, you've written recently, uh, We Are Not Numbers that cover all aspects of daily life for Palestinians in Gaza from all the many stories that we don't hear outside. You yourself have written recently about the arrival of COVID-19 in, in Gaza. We're going to share that link in a minute. But I'd like you to talk to us a little bit about those conditions because people are living in lockdown conditions in many different parts of the world. Uh, but of course, it's it's different when you start from a position of a blockade, as as Palestinians in Gaza have experienced for many years. Yeah, uh, of course. Uh, so basically, recently, uh, so many people were talking about Gaza because you know Gaza has been under this Israeli siege for almost fourteen years. That's like the longest quarantine ever. And for me, as a young Palestinian youth, like I witnessed my whole life actually under the Israel blockade. So um, for now, as coronavirus got into the world, um, everyone has to stay at their home and they cannot go out and they lack uh, freedom of movement. Uh, the world is going crazy. And at that point, uh, it was the best point to actually point to Gaza and remind the world that Gaza has been under blockade for 14 years, talking about two generations whose lives got wasted, literally. And uh, uh, people here uh, are sort of used to it. And because of this street blockade, uh, 
you know, very few people can actually get into Gaza. Very few people can actually get out of Gaza. So um, when this whole coronavirus started, uh, we thought in Gaza that we are like 100% safe. And um, it was spread around the world the first week, the second week. But then um, two passengers uh, came to Gaza, two Palestinians actually who were abroad and they were coming back to Gaza and uh, they tested positive. And, uh, you know, just out of nowhere, the whole Gaza Strip flipped, you know, turned upside down and people started to actually realize that coronavirus, it is a real deal, you know, it is something real. So um, uh, people here started to, you know, to, to take, uh, let's just say, opportunities to provide for their families for as long as they can. So those people who actually got some money saved, they would go out to the markets, uh, to the malls, and they would buy groceries. But that's just a very few people here in Gaza. We're talking about their certain, uh, their recent, or actually the rest of people here in Gaza who cannot afford to get, you know, groceries, especially at this time. So basically, we've got let's just say cab drivers, or we've got people who work in shops, you know, or restaurants, or coffee houses. Basically, this is how it goes for them. They work a day to get, you know, money for the day and then gain food for the day. So, like, it's a weekly income for them. So, if they do not work today, they wouldn't be able to afford to get food to their families. And, um, of course, uh, that prevented the government uh, from, you know, forcing a curfew here in Gaza. They know they cannot do that. So, um, you know, people flipped out for some days and, you know, Gaza went crazy. And uh, what I love about what happened is that uh, the civilian movement here in Gaza decided to, you know, be hand in hand. They started initiatives, especially used here in Gaza, because they knew, like, not everyone can afford to get food. And, uh, of course, we cannot count on our, go our government. We cannot count on anyone. So it was people with people, you know, helping people and... Um, uh, I think the majority of people got what they needed. And uh, after that, um, let's just say more people got tested positive here in Gaza to kind of about the policemen. So people here started to realize, okay, it is getting real. And uh, because Gaza lacks facilities like hospitals, uh, people here in Gaza, the government people went actually to hotels, used them as quarantines. And uh, I've got one here across my, it's my point of view actually, across my building. So uh, they turned this hotel into a quarantine. And uh, I think this is where it starts to get real for me. Uh, you would see like uh, policemen all there every day. You would see uh, ambulance cars. And uh, of course, uh, for me as a neighborhood, it's really quiet most of the time. It got really scary recently, especially with, with, when more passengers would get into Gaza into quarantine. So after that, we know, of course, not many people can you just say buy masks or gloves or uh, hand sanitizers because you know we cannot afford that. To be honest, this, this is we cannot afford that. Um, you know, but people still like so many people would stay indoors. But after a while, no new uh cases were reported so that was good people started to go out again and um just recently uh for us in Minnet numbers we got back to our office last week we started that and uh we were still you know taking our chances uh we're using gloves and masks and the hand sanitizers because of course we do not want to risk it but still, uh, so now uh, the general situation here in Gaza, uh, so many people got cured. So I think uh, we've got only four current virus cases here in Gaza. So uh, people feel safer than ever. And um, uh, for now, we've got so many people who actually want to get back to, to Gaza. And uh, to me, I feel like writing a story on that because, uh, uh, you know, as coronavirus turned the whole world upside down, you know, it turned actually Gaza up and the world down. So, uh, of course, we lack uh, medical facilities, equipment, tests, whatever. Uh, but because, you know, as they say, a pound, uh, let's just say an ounce of prevention uh, is worth a pound of cure. And um, people here, like, did not actually risk it at all. So uh, anyone who gets into Gaza, they got no talk, 
no option. You've got to go to quarantine because you cannot risk the lives of two millions here in Gaza. And imagine if Gaza has got in, an outbreak, it would be a disaster. And uh, it would just spread out here and uh, it would be like, like a zombie movie because people are going to die, they're not going to get drugs, they're not going to get uh, any type of medical treatments. And um, it's going to be really disaster. So, uh, um, I, Thanks, I think... Jared. It's, um, it's really great to hear that um, coronavirus is being managed so, so well in Gaza and that people are really taking that on board and working together. Um, I, I just wanted to ask you both, as um, storytellers, journalists, filmmakers, you know, um, some, one of the questions that came through was, you know, can this documentary be shown on Netflix? <laughs> Um, I just wondered, would you both speak to, um, maybe starting with Abby, because I know we don't have much more time with you, um, the hurdles you face with, with sharing um, the media that you make more broadly and, and what kind of um, issues come up with that for you? Absolutely. Uh, and, and it is amazing to hear from Riot about what's going on in Gaza um, and the containment. Meanwhile, our president is telling people to drink bleach um, 50,000 people have died here. It's absolutely cataclysmic and uh, it's really shocking the uh, lack of proper national response from our president. So it's amazing to hear that that's happening. I, I hope and pray and my thoughts are with everyone in Gaza to, to hopefully contain this and, and not let an outbreak happen. Um, as far as the media limitations, absolutely. This is why we chose a direct distribution model on Vimeo. I think a lot of people don't realize how, well, maybe, you know, I, I'm sure people joining this call do. This topic is uh, completely censored. There is no avenue or space to talk about Palestinians, to talk about the truth about Israel or, you know, US empire to that extent on corporate media. I mean, corporate media is subsidized by banks, oil contractors and weapons. Uh, right? Defense contractors. So all of these people kind of subsidize this, this sponsored news that we watch every day. And by proxy, all of these other outlets um, and, and, you know, the HBOs, the Netflixes, I mean, it's all kind of run um, by the same establishment and, and they have a certain line to toe. And if you kind of go outside of that narrative, then, then you are shunned, essentially. Um, and there is an orthodoxy and you cannot divert from that orthodoxy. And so Palestinian rights is something that I feel like a lot of people who want to cover this issue know that they have to go the very grassroots models, um, kind of putting things up online for free, um, not really expecting to have something that's really put on a pedestal on a national level or international level. And, that, and that's what we've realized, even though this film is so important, even though we tried really, really hard uh, to and it's so crucial, right, to be seen by the world and to have the Palestinians who made the film have their voices heard by everyone. It is nearly impossible to do so. Um, to get on Netflix, you need to have Netflix basically approve your content. Um, and that's if you have an army of people soliciting them, if you have the money to pay initially up front. Uh, uh, and so on and so on. And so it's very, very difficult. Um, and then if you're looking at things like HBO or Showtime, I mean, that's absolutely impossible. We've looked at Amazon Prime. That's, that's something that isn't really worthwhile either because that's where you're paying a bulk amount up front and then it just kind of gets lost in, lost in the ocean of content um, and, and it would never really get you know, seen unless people are searching for it. So that's why we chose Vimeo. We chose the direct distribution and really are trying to get people to just show this in a super grassroots level, do Zoom meetings like this, especially during quarantine. This is a beautiful way that we can galvanize the world to, to, to tune in to something on a virtual screening. Um, host your own screenings everywhere. We have agitator packs of DVDs for very cheap on our website, Gaza Fights for Freedom. We have a quarantine discount code that you can actually watch uh, if you type lockdown into the Vimeo code at rental. Um, and so we're trying to do everything that we can to get this out and to get the word out. And it really is just a matter of telling your friends, family, coworkers, colleagues about this situation, about the truth, spreading the information on a grassroots level. Um, the limitations are very, 
very uh, extreme. And I think people realize that, I mean, whether it's, whether it's Palestine or, or, or Israel or really what the U.S. empire does abroad, but that, that's the fight that we're up against and it's kind of all intertwined with how media operates. So we kind of know what's ahead of us and we know the fight and we know what we have to do and that's what we have to do. Thank you. And I'm just back, back briefly to say we have tons of questions. We're not going to be able to get to them all. There is a post webinar survey and we encourage you to fill that in. There's a poll up right now, which I'm going to close in a moment about what you're willing to do, what attendees are interested in doing. But uh, when we close that and share the results, I would um, uh, encourage you to also go to our post webinar survey, tell us your comments, your additional questions, but also we will have some follow up links there. And we will be sending a follow-up um, email to everybody who registered uh, to let you know where you can get all this information if you didn't catch it all from the chat because it's been pretty busy. Um, I'm going to disappear now and let Nalan ask some more questions. Um, just that same question to you, Raid, about um, ways that your um, media that you're creating and the stories that you're sharing there, um, they're particular hurdles that you're facing or are there ways people could help get those stories out further? Well, um, I work in social media for Wernet numbers and uh, I believe in uh, the power of social media and, you know, media. So this is how we get to people. This is how we tell them uh, our stories and this, this is how we let them know what's really happening. So uh, uh, as for, you know, some platforms like Netflix, HBOs and whatever, uh, this is not really a thing still here in Gaza. So, you know, just very few people are starting to watch Netflix. So uh, uh, I think it is important uh, for the people to get access incredible films like Abby's and uh, you know they I, I believe they should be available uh, on almost every platform like as many platforms as possible because uh, this is how you know you get to as many people as possible and uh, of course uh, as some people we've got to spread out the word and uh, uh, you know capturing this what's happening documenting in it uh, you know, you let nobody actually disagree with you when they see you, but they saw. So uh, uh, I, I believe in almost uh, everything that's been happening, uh, you know, in, in, when it comes to the media on the Great Future March, because, uh, you know, I believe that most of what's taken on the Palestinian part uh, is actually like 100% true and no one would fake anything. But uh, when it comes to Israel and uh, their excuses, uh, you know, defending itself whatsoever. So right now they're exposed. So uh, yeah, uh, thanks Abba for this film. And um, I totally agree with, with what you said right now. There's, there's been a question come through from one of our viewers who has asked about um, obviously the blockade um, at Gaza is, is the main issue. Um, but there's been a question about the Gaza Youth Committee um, and there was a, there's been a, somebody said that the Hamas have um, prosecuted people for having Zoom meetings with, with Israel. Just, just wanting to check if that's something that you've heard about on the ground at all, anything like that, Rayad or... Well, well, it it actually happened. Uh, we've got some activists here in Gaza who were in touch with Israeli people, and uh, uh, of course, uh, the government here in Gaza uh, did not take that easily. So uh, they basically put them in, in prison. But uh, if if you look at what's happening here in Gaza from our perspective, the people perspective, um, you know, most people here believe that you cannot have peace with someone who's already killing you and uh, when you have these kind of dialogues you know you know you do not make sense because this is an equation you've got an occupier you've got an occupied so basically when you talk about like peace it feels like you've got you know two equal sides but they're not two equal sides so israel you know you just saw the film israel has been shouting people paramedics journalists people of all kinds women young men uh children so how, how do you feel about going online so that the whole world would watch you and actually talk about peace and uh, you know try to have some connections so uh, when it comes to people this is a serious opinion here you cannot do that 
uh, if you want to make peace with someone who's been killing our people, that means you're not on our side. So uh, this is just the majority of people. This is how they think and uh, this is what they believe. So yes, uh, I think the majority of people in Gaza agree with what Hamas did and that they don't want uh, any, let's just say manipulations, mental manipulations happen here, especially that uh, Israel would target young people at a young age. So uh, they would grow up to believe that Israel is a good state or is a good country that just wants peace. But we live here in Gaza, we get pumped in Gaza, we have the power crisis in Gaza, we suffer on a daily basis in Gaza. So if one gets sick, they cannot travel. If one gets a scholarship, they hardly travel. So uh, so many people must stand so many chances. So uh, I, I think because this is our lives, you know, and uh, we're growing up and uh, they're getting into ways. So uh, the Gazan street doesn't agree with you know, peaceful, uh, let's just say, meetings with Israeli people. Um, so there's so many questions that have come in. Um, there, there's been some questions that have come in about the relationship with, with Egypt and that border and how that's perceived. Um, I don't know if either of you feel like answering that one. <laughs> well, um, I think recently, uh, because of coronavirus, uh, the, the border has been extremely good. And uh, w when it comes to, you know, the border, you know, genuinely in recent years, it's actually been closed most of the time. So uh, uh, the relationship with Egypt, I would say it's unstable. So one time the like, we're, we're with you, Gaza, and we don't want Israel to have a war against you and kill you. But at the same time, when we get, you know, injured people, you know, Egypt would not approve their travels, you know, through the airport or because uh, I don't know why. I mean, sometimes they've got disagreements with Hamas, so they punish the Palestinian people here in Gaza. But sometimes when Israel strikes Gaza, Gaza responds, uh, they just talk to Hamas. Hamas just keep it calm because uh, we don't want you to lose more people because you're already suffering. So uh, I would say it's really unstable. Uh, the border has been you know, unstable for a long time. It's been closed most of the time, except for recent months, I would say. And um, I, I'm not even quite sure if the Egyptian government is on our side or not. But yes, I think the Palest uh, the Egyptian people are on, on our side. So uh, I don't know if that makes sense to you, but it's really unstable. So it's really hard to talk about it. Sorry, that was a, a difficult question. There's, there's also been uh, a question about the, the March of Return and, and what that, obviously it's um, covered in the movie and, and what that means. And um, I guess there's a, a few people who would like to hear your perspective about what the March of Return um, symbolises and means for you. Well, um, okay, uh, the Great Return March to so many people here in Gaza means you go out to the borders, you protest, you demand your rights, you get hurt by the word, and um, you know, you hope for change. But for me personally, and this is just right, this is not, we are not numbers, this is not the Palestinian people. To me, I, I chose to be wise, actually. I never went there because I believe if I ever go there, I will eventually get shot. And if I ever get shot, no one's gonna take care of me not people here in Gaza, not people abroad. So I would suffer just like so many people here have been suffering for months. And uh, for real, I'm telling you this, so many people needed surgery and they never got surgery. So eventually they had to lose their body parts. So for me, I'm not willing to take that risk. For me personally, I choose to be smart. So I choose to use my power, um, just say the English language, my citizen journalism skills, uh, my storytelling and to tell stories about what's happening here in Gaza. And uh, uh, when, when it first started, I was against it because, you know, it was, you know, extremely hard to see. Like on the first day, like the first Friday, it was, you know, unbelievable. It was like in movies, you would see like over a hundred, wait, tens of people got killed and so many people got shot and you would see like the smoke, it's really black and it's really horrific. And uh, you would see like 
the street snipers, the armies all there. And uh, I, I would think about it, like, why would I go there? And even if I got like a press costume and go there to tell them like, I'm just a journalist, eventually they're gonna shot me. So uh, to me, um, I never went there, but I believe that uh, it managed to grab the world's attention. And uh, I think this was the point of it in the first place to tell the world that Palestinian people here in Gaza want their rights they're, they're not asking for too much. They just want their human rights, you know? They just want to travel, they want to work, they want to make money, they want to eat because the majority are really poor. So, uh, I, I mean, I know so many people would disagree with me, but this is just my personal opinion. Uh, as for my old, you know, just say colleagues, other journalists who went there, like Yasser Morteja, like, they just broke my heart, you know? And that taught me if Yasser Morteja got killed, what makes you think you're not going to get killed? So for me, I just chose to be wise. I, I, some people would say it's coward, but I would go with wise. And uh, I, I think it wouldn't make sense if I went there, tried to report what's happening while I, I can't do it from a safer place. Like you just say home or from, you know, places that are away from the fences like i would not go to the front lines because that's when people get killed or actually the whole border is not even safe Gaza is not safe so uh, it's just how i think <laughs> thank you you're right and it definitely has um got the world's attention particularly with the um assistance of films like this one you've made abby um, there's a lot of uh, really positive comments coming through about the film and all the work that would have been put in to put that together. Um, I guess we're running out of time soon, but I wondered what you thought um, about what the what the international solidarity movement should focus on. Should we be focusing on the killers, BDS movement, pressure to governments? Um, what what do you think the most important thing to focus on? Is? Um, maybe you want to start with that one, Abby. Sure, and and Riot, I just wanted to comment on what you were saying. I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it's so horrifying to see that, you know, the first six weeks, uh, even medics and journalists were saying, you know, we weren't specifically targeted and there was something about May 14th that they started to kill us purposefully methodically and and that was so they wouldn't go i mean it, as you said i mean medics journalists why would you go knowing that you could just die and get targeted and it, you know even though that this is supposed to be banned by international law no one was doing anything about it and even when the world tried to hold israel accountable the u.s had veto power and they, they said you know that you that israel couldn't be held accountable for anything. So it's just this vicious cycle and it's really, really traumatic. Um, and I don't know if I would have gone to the march either. I mean, it's something that's really, it's it's a really heavy thing. And when I heard Razan's colleagues talking about how terrified she was, you know, a lot of people think that these people at the march were just fearless and they were, you know, they didn't care if they died and they're just running there to, to sacrifice their lives for their country and stuff. And that's not what happened at all. I mean, Razan was terrified, her colleagues were terrified, but that's what they did anyway. They knew that they had to help people even if they were risking their lives to do so, even if it meant they were absolutely terrified to do so. And that, that really showed me that's what true bravery is. And I, I just can't imagine anyone um, you know, especially in my country, <laughs> uh, really understanding what that takes and, and how much you need to, ha you know, how much strength you need to have to really do that. I think the international solidarity movement needs to be a multifaceted approach. I think that, um, you know, it, it depends on what capacity you can give. It depends on if you have links to uh, government, uh, right, politicians, organizations, if you have a stronger voice that can be heard through those outlets, that's where you need to focus on. If you have media savvy, like Raid, um, if you have links to certain media networks, grassroots networks, if you have the ability to write to your local newspaper, all of these things put together, if you have access to podcasts, local radio, utilize that. Because again, this is a grassroots pressure campaign, international, I'm sorry, politically educating in a grassroots way. And that is first and foremost what we need to do. If you know people on college campuses, if you are on a college campus, absolutely get involved with the divestment movement. 
um, on your college campus. Find out how you can link up with solidarity organizations on college campuses. If you are just an activist in general, start going to other meetings, linking up with other activists in your area, meetup groups, and start bringing up Palestine. How can you fit Palestine into whatever issue we are talking about? Because we are all one human family, all of these things link together. And so again, I think it's multifaceted and um, it's really important that we explore all avenues of how we can really resist and um, strengthen the call for international solidarity and a pressure campaign to abolish the apartheid state and, and do whatever we can, whatever we can, um, but especially you know, putting yourself out there in every way that you can and, and making yourself visible, I think is, is first and foremost what we need to do. And as I had mentioned, I mean, social media is a huge aspect of this. Um, the Correcting the Record campaign, Israel spends God knows how much money just, just kind of correcting the record, and they can't control that narrative anymore on social media. And I, I think that's another testament to how successful the grassroots pressure campaign has been, how successful organizations like We Are Not Numbers has been to really show the truth about what's happening in Gaza. And that's why you see they, they simply don't have control over that anymore. They may have corporate media, but they certainly do not have social media. And so that's where we can thrive and continue to expand the truth and continue to push information that is really, really relevant to contrast uh, that mainstream media narrative. And we just have to do it every day until we win and we will win. Um, and so thank you so much everyone for putting this together. Thank you to the Freedom Flotilla. It, it's amazing what you guys are doing. Thank you, Riot. Thank you, We Are Not Numbers. It was an honor to be here and I just hope that we can keep marching and fighting together. Thank you very much. Thank you for being with us this evening, Abby. It never gets tired to watch your film. It's hard to watch, but it's important to watch and it's even more important to share. So we're providing the links. We will provide them again. Um, support Abby's work by sharing her film. Support We Are Not Numbers by getting the word out. They're also in uh, Ramadan Karim in uh, this month of giving. They're also looking for donations to support their work because it's not easy to be an independent journalist anywhere. It's very, very difficult to be an independent journalist in Palestine and particularly in Gaza. So please support their work and share their stories. They've got amazing writing and also many amazing videos about daily life in Gaza. There's two videos which were sponsored by the Freedom Flotilla, one about fishers in Gaza, and one about one of the young am amputees. It's called Dreams in the Crosshair. Uh, one of those people who lost a limb and keeps on. So very inspiring work. Follow their work, please. Um, the links are being shared. They will also be shared through our survey. If you go to our survey, there's information about the Freedom Flotilla campaigns in different places. Um, so in Aotearoa, Kiora, Gaza, here in Australia, Gaza Freedom Flotilla, Australia, our friends at um, Free Palestine, Melbourne, other solidarity organizations, wherever you are, as Abby said, there's always a way to speak up, make it, make your, your presence known, make your views known, make the truth known. And it begins with each one of those conversations. So share the film, share their words, um, join a group, support our work. Uh, people are asking about the Freedom Flotilla. There's a statement that's been shared. We're not sailing now because the places we need to visit are a lockdown for and tr international travel in general is locked down due to COVID-19. But we will sail again. We continue to sail. We put ourselves on the line against the blockade, um, not because of our right to visit uh, Gaza, but because of the right of Palestinians throughout Palestine to travel freely, have freedom of movement, to move around their country, leave and return freely. That's a fundamental human right. And we're about freedom of movement among other, free, uh, other freedoms. So there's more information there uh, being shared about the, the Freedom Flotilla. Please connect with local campaigns. Please fill in our survey. Thank you very much again, Abby and Ryan, for being with us tonight. Thank you, Nalan, on behalf of uh, Free Palestine. Uh, Melbourne, would you like to close with some words there? Uh, thanks so much. This is a um, really early event for us, and we're so thrilled to have collaborated with you all and to have Abby and Ryan with us. Um, thank you so much for all the work that you're doing, um, and we will continue to push out the, um, and highlight the work that you're doing as much as we can. Um, I don't know if either of you have any final words you wanted to say. Um, okay, uh, I just want to say one thing. Uh, you know, so many people would come to me, ask me, okay, Raid, we're just simple people around the world. What can we do for Palestine? What can we do for Gaza? And uh, I answered this uh, a lot, and uh, this is my answer. So uh, I, I know people would say, like, we're with you. 
people will do, but our governments are against you, so we don't know what to say. Here's what you can do. Actually, I believe in the power of people. Uh, in America, they say, we the people. Means that people power, and uh, we can do whatever we can and we want. So uh, everyone can do something in their own way. So uh, if you're a writer, you can write. If you're a journalist, you know you can write and capture and make movies and create media and films like just Abby did. If you're a photographer, you can take photos. If you're just say um, like a singer, you can sing. You know. You can do everything, but you just look at yourself, think of what you can do. Some people can, you know, give us, you just say, financial aid, but they cannot do anything. You do that. Some people can actually tweet on Twitter, we support Palestine, we support Gaza. Oh, look, what's happening in Gaza, see what's happening in the Great Southern March. You can do that. And the power of social media, do not ever underestimate the power of social media. It makes a difference. And uh, just one tweet by you can change someone else's mind and they can learn more about Gaza. And you actually can create change from a post, a tweet, anything. So uh, that's, that's the, the message. Do not underestimate anything you can do. You can draw, you can paint, you can sing, you can dance. Air, Palestinian Debka dances, songs. Mm -hmm. So uh, that will be my answer. Do not underestimate anything you can do, anything you can offer, anything, literally anything. Thank you so much again, both of you. Uh, and um, please uh, stay in touch, stay engaged, stay safe, but stay in touch and stay engaged. Uh, the, the most dangerous thing we can do is to disengage from these struggles. We have to speak up. Thank you for having me, and uh, thank you for giving me the chance to represent We Are Not Numbers in Gaza. And uh, wow, it's an honor to talk to all. Thank you so much. And we're going to leave with another take of the song that we heard at the beginning. Uh, for those who, who saw our, our intro, we're going to go out with the music again from the Women's Vote to Gaza, uh, a video which is on the Freedom Flotilla YouTube site. Uh, the Women's Vote to Gaza, featuring the voices of Suna Sofia Rexen. Uh, a sailor and musician from uh, Norway, and uh, Emma Ringfist, a sailor and musician from Norway, along with uh, Marama Davidson, an MP from Aotearoa, uh, now co-leader of the New Zealand Green Party, singing on board um, the Women's Vote to Gaza 2016. So, Happy uh, Ramadan. Happy Hi. Ramadan. Ramadan Mubarak. Ramadan Bye, guys. Bye. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs> Curled up and sailed out from the shore of Spain. Our boat Zaytuna Olive, that's her name. And Olive is the symbol of a faraway place to which we steer our course across the waves. We are 13 women here to sail with peace in our hands towards our sisters in this foreign land from many different corners of this world we have come to bring to you the freedom of our soul we will sail for your freedom our sisters in palestine by the light of the stars at night and the power of the sea so very bright as the world is watching us we bring our women's voice with a message that we all should have a choice your grandmothers they planted olive trees upon this land where you should live in peace 
Those trees of thousand years, they have been dug away. May your daughters plant new seeds and watch them stay. We will sail for your freedom, our sisters in Palestine. We will never be silent until you Sisters in Palestine, we will never be silent until you are free.